Okay, that was uh, Ken. He's about five minutes out, so let's go ahead and start. And um, go ahead, Paul. Tell us tell us if there's anything new, or uh, give us a rundown on what's going on in the lab. Uh, um, there's nothing going on in the lab, except uh, we got a little security alert that we're trying to track down. It's like there might have been some kind of networking issue at Remote Lab South. It should have no impact on Remote Lab West, which is what people are using today. Um, nothing, uh, nothing to report. I've been spending all my time on uh, kidding up the RF bit banger, for instance. This is half of the main circuit boards for the, for the batch two RF bit banger. And there's lots more little parts that yet to be kitted up. So that's what's taken up my time. Nothing to report. Well, we did get um, MATLAB successfully moved over to to a new account, so that that folks can have access to it. And we solved some some problems over the past week, and um, that seems to be working really well uh, for me and also for Talak. Uh, and I think that that Leonard might have also logged in and tried to use it. He may need some help reestablishing his uh, access to his virtual machine because he had to switch computers. Um, but yeah, things seem to be working pretty well. Can you can you tell any difference when MATLAB and Simulink are are being heavily used, like in the like temperature or or any other category of of telemetry for the for the remote lab? I have not looked for it. I can tell you that it doesn't heat up the drives enough to make an alert, which will sometimes happen for uh, for heavy duty disk intensive activities like installing software but for running it i haven't noticed any problem i can uh, i can look at the stats next time you're running something intensive on matlab and see if it makes any difference but unless you use up a whole bunch of the cores and run them full blast you probably won't be able to overheat anything cpu related the drives are the main thing that are temperature sensitive and also temperature measuring so you can tell that that something happened okay yeah, so far when I run HTOP for either MATLAB or Simulink, um, the the cr number crunching can go on for like fifteen or twenty minutes for for the the current like OFDM work, but it doesn't really involve a lot of cores, so it's not not the same as uh, like installing Vivado or running some of the some of the multi hour runs of Vivado seem to kind of push things. So I was just curious if MATLAB or Simulink had had triggered anything. Sounds like no. They're good. And then, uh, yeah, Anshul said he was going to reboot and come back. And I'm expecting Ken to walk in any moment. Uh, so let's see. I have, I don't have any, um, I don't think I have any updates for Hyperia for the big transponder, except that I've done uh, more reading and documentation and support for the folks that are that are working on the polyphase filter bank. Uh, so I've been doing support over the past week, answering questions and and trying to to keep everybody uh, happy and and all of that. Uh, so that's that's pretty much what I've been doing on on Hyperia. I've spent um, some time. We'll talk about it tomorrow at the Neptune meetup. But I've got uh, we've got some some good solid progress on uh, turning Simulink into HDL for, for Neptune. All right, and I, uh, oh, and hello, Anshul. So I'll just turn it over to you. Uh, so, so let us know how it's going. And uh, if you have any questions or comments, concerns, need any resources, have any roadblocks. Sure. Uh, so this week, uh, try to understand how I can use MATLAB examples for uh, our transceiver. Went through going, going, going through the docs. I, I just want to make sure that on one hand, um, we have this design um, using Subotos uh, encoder, and then we integrate our stuff along with that encoder, and also. I want to parallelly pursue this path of using MATLAB to do the job for us. Uh, so yeah, this week was that. 
trying to set up MATLAB, going through the docs, going through tutorials, and also um, made progress on getting ADI example um, to work on our FPGA, let's see, 706. So yeah, pursuing both the panel paths uh, and trying to get um, over there solution working for us. My aim is that if I, if I get, if I, as uh, we have found in the past, if we get stuck on one thing, then at least the other one, the one is available. So yeah, that's why I'm pursuing both of them. Okay. Any, yeah, if there's any, anything at all um, that you need to know, then you, you can, then you can't figure it out from, from what we've got written down so far, then, then just ask me on Slack and I'll do all that I can. Um, yeah, we the the MATLAB uh, program and and Simulink and all of the the toolboxes and everything are are successfully running on um, mm -hmm. on a, an account called Matt. Uh, I'm sure you've seen the the write up on that, and the all the good documentation for that is is over on the Neptune Trello, um, and it's now stable up to up to a point. Are you are you over there on that Trello already? Because I'm. You don't have to be. No, I don't see you. Okay. So what I'm going to do is bring all of what we've found out um, mm. and and nailed down and is now working. I'm going to bring that over to the uh, remote labs repository mm. as a markdown mm. document yeah. Yeah. so that so that everybody can can see like how to use our our MATLAB and Simulink and yeah. and, and and the HDL coder specific lessons. Mm -hmm. So because there's an awful lot to it. It's a uh, Mm. Just like any, you know, any powerful uh, or any maneuverable tool is also mm. inher inherently unstable. So it's a, it's got a lot of moving parts to it. So we've made pretty steady progress, but it's a, a pretty steep learning curve, like a lot of other, um, you know, like a lot of other things like that. So yeah, what I'll do is I'll move the stuff from the Neptune Trello board over to a Markdown document. Um, mm. Because I think we're at a point where at least the basics of getting up and running can can be repeated by pretty much anybody that already has uh, VM access to the remote labs. That's good. That's good. And also, as part of UK startup, I got one year free access to MATLAB for the premium softwares and features. So that's good. Okay. Uh, I have it on my local system, so that's that's working fine. Uh, and also, I uh, I need to try uh, the package. The, uh, the tower file that you have created, whether I can uh, use that, import that, import the project directly to my Vitis. Yeah. In Slack? Yeah. You should have, or the, the zip file. So what I did is, so I tried to use inside Vitis, I tried to use their GitHub integration and managed to brick the entire thing. Uh, mm -hmm. So it's a little, it was a little tricky. But there is a way to export the project. So you just export a zip. And I just uploaded the zip file to the repo. So if you didn't download the zip, you should have everything. Mm -hmm. That'll work with our Remote Lab West hardware. So, you know, so if you if you have a different set of hardware that you're working with at home, it won't. But once you once you expand the zip file, you should be able to you then to go back in and edit it and to target different hardware if you want. Yeah. I wouldn't try that because I don't know what else needs to be changed. Um, mm, but the zip yeah. files should work. I, you know, and if I, if I get another burst of like inspiration to go try to learn how to do the integrated Git stuff inside Vitus, then I will. Uh, but it was uh, the, just exporting the file and just having a series of zip files. Like pick the newest zip file from the repo mm. for for this, and and it should it should work. Mm -hmm. um, that that may be as good as a uh, old fogey like me can, can do, <laughs> you know, so, so, but thank you very much for, for asking for that. Cause it's, it's really what we need to be doing on the, on the um, software side. We, we need to have the whole like Vitus environment, everything you should just, you should be able to open the project rather than having to recreate it on your own every time from just the source code being published. So, you know, I mean, it's better than nothing to give. Here's the C file that we're using to run the hardware in the lab. That's great. You know, because without that, there's no one else can share and and help. 
uh, but just having the entire project to be open and all the libraries, especially, is mm -hmm. a pain, kind of a pain to get those in every mm -hmm. time. So, yeah, I haven't, I have not worked on that in the past week. So the there's no, no, nothing new. Uh, the what we were trying to do is get a really nice demo that's close to Opulent Voice. Um, mm -hmm. it, we call it the Wiggle because it's a cool looking wiggly set of. Uh, of signals uh, working um, on the FPG. So not just on the Pluto, but on the big FPGAs. And we found a lot of very surprising things uh, along the way. So it was a, a worthwhile effort. I don't think it's working yet. Is that true, Paul? No, it is not working yet. Okay, close, but not quite. Okay, so yeah, we, we clock rates, I think, are the thing that is, is getting us uh, so. So yeah, over the next week, let's dive in and and get things working for you, and uh, and try to make some some good progress. It's a uh, much closer than it ever has been. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So yeah, hello Ken. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. And uh, let's uh, let's hear about your work in integrating the Polyphase Filter Bank. And this is receiver side work. So Polyphase Filter Bank is on the receiver side for Hyperia. So, and if you need to share the screen, uh, you should be able to. So go ahead. Okay. Don't have really a lot to show up on the screen, but uh, been writing a uh, wrapper for the Polyphase code that uh, basically is just adapting the AXI to the uh, FIFO with the proper flow control and bit widths. And uh, that's pretty much it. I'm trying to think. Yeah, got the, <clears throat> just uh, drew up a little bit of logic to um, what I think. There's not a lot of documentation on, on some of these, but I, I think I understand at least what the signal should do. I guess we'll, we'll see in simulation if, they actually do what I think, but because uh, <laughs> there is some, there's flow control on both sides of the, uh, uh, basically the cut point at which I try, I'm trying to insert the polyphase filters between the um, this thing called CPAC, which kind of consolidates the four uh, RX uh, as interfaces coming coming from the analog devices. It's basically at that point, it's it's like four separate 16-bit um, sample streams goes into this block called CPAC, which has a FIFO interface, which the interface is normally in the ADI reference designed to uh, to a RX DMA, and uh, basically trying to insert it there. And the, the PFB itself has natively AXI uh, interfaces, so adapting the overflow to the ready and valid and stuff is basically and and resizing the boss that's that's what's going on right now so that's all i got okay thanks and the the resizing of of the bus um what he's referring to is a, a really we're able to to use some blocks uh, from from Swato's FPGA cores repository, and we uh, over the past week we forked this repository to to our uh, project to our collection, um, and we added some some things to it. And we'll also you know offer it back to Swato as well in a pull request. Um, but he's fully he's fully aware of the of the shenanigans. Um, so the FPGA cores is a bunch of AXI-based utilities that Swato has written, and we've used them uh, a couple of times, and they're great. So, and we added an embiggener, so to go from you know a small size to a larger size uh, bus. That was what we had to have for uh, the Cobb's decoder work, uh, and the sort of the bus resizing stuff or the the shim layers, these these utility blocks. Um, that's that's what, what Ken's one of the ones that that Ken is going to use, um, and something we we've discussed over the past week is uh, 
you know, the polyphase filter bank is created by a, a script. So this is this is code from Theseus Core's uh, open source project for polyphase work and multi-rate work. And not just a channelizer, but they also do the, go the other way. You can have a synthesizer as well. This is really good stuff. We, we've demonstrated it in public before. It's been under development for a while. The the team that, that does it, it's a pair of programmers that are, that are good. Um, but the code is generated by, uh, it's generated. So you put in your configuration. Um, and I think Matthew helped with this. This is, uh, uh, we now run a server that that presents this uh, sort of interface. So you put in your configuration and you get a polyphase structure or, or batch of code. This means that it does not have a whole lot of comments in it. So that's what Ken's talking about is that the code comes out not commented. Um, and so the, just one of the decisions that he had to make over the past week was, do we then take this code and leave it alone? So if someone was going to recreate this design, one of the questions that, that we have to ask ourselves when we're using this is if someone comes along and recreates it, do we just leave that alone and say, look, feed this script, this configuration, put out this block, then here's this wrapper that takes care of everything else, or do we freeze dry that produced code and then publish that as a static block? So what Ken's trying to do is write a wrapper for the generated code so that we touch as little as possible from Theseus cores and kind of preserve the dynamic and adaptable nature. Um, and what we're gonna see if this this works out okay. So I, I told him that if he ends up bending over backwards, uh, trying to, you know, preserve it and and that the, sh the shim layer or the or any wrappers become, uh, you know, to more trouble than the worth that we go back and we just go ahead and take a snapshot of the code that's produced by the, server or script and then uh, you know modify that and that becomes you know more static rather than dynamically created uh, code right. there's right. there's advantages and disadvantages to both approaches is, oh go is ahead this appropriate place to make a comment about these approaches absolutely at, at any time please go ahead sure so what my experience is that and i think we saw this already if you keep the dynamic generation as a, um, so basically the server we put together that will generate the code, that needs to be kept in some sort of configuration management because that could get lost or changed over time and then you're effectively unable to generate that code again. You know, that's kind of the situation we end up in, in that when we're trying to use it because stuff had moved on, right? The the Python, uh, and other sub layers that that script was dependent on had changed over time, but the script hadn't been updated. So, you know, maintaining that script in a way um, that can regenerate, you know, that take, would take some extra effort as well and needs to be considered that all those pieces that feed into it are kept in, in configuration as well in order to be able to regenerate that script versus just taking what came out of it and using that. So, I, I think that's just the point I'm trying to make is that the, um, if we want to keep that script usable to regenerate over time, then it's not just the script, it's the pieces that go into it as well that have to be considered and maintained. Strongly concur. Yeah, very well said. Sort of you break it, you bought it. <laughs> yeah, so the, uh, as I think, to this week, uh, and, and we're going to go ahead and proceed with preserving the the code generation uh, capabilities in in Theseus cores, and and going ahead and owning that. Um, so we forked a copy of the Theseus cores, and um, and then we, with your help, set up a, a server that would produce the the code. So the mechanisms work today, and and we do have have it. Uh, you know, at least uh, this is a, a working existing copy. Um, and we, we should, in order to, to really kind of leverage this, we, we definitely need to go the extra mile and, and make sure that it's uh, copied backup. We have a backup configuration management's working for that. So thank you. The point's very well taken. And, and I guess 
you know, we don't necessarily have to maintain it ourselves, but we I did submit a pull request upstream, but I, I hadn't seen any action on that. So, I mean, if the upstream is not maintaining it, then, you know, we might have to fork it and, you know, maintain it ourselves, whether or not they take the pull requests. Correct. Yeah, we do have a current uh, fork in the project, so so we're we're good there. But uh, that's what we usually do is if we if we need to rely on something, then we usually go ahead and fork it, and we also um, make sure that we submit pull requests back to the you know back upstream. So like with with respect to like Ambisat, that's that's how we that's how we did that. Uh, that was successful, and um, you know I'm. I'm confident that we can that the the that the authors uh, appreciate the the effort, the usage, and the attention, and and um, when they get around to it, uh, they may go ahead and and incorporate the uh, the improvements and and corrections. Yeah, good stuff. Okay, any other resources needed or any roadblocks that you're facing? Anything that needs to be any new business? Anything needs to be brought up? Our next big demo uh, demonstration or exhibition will be in um, late summer in Las Vegas, Nevada. We'll be in the RF Village uh, doing an open source showcase of any and all projects that we have. So so my goal here is to get uh, high for IES stuff, uh, the big transponder stuff, and also Neptune, um, Ribbit, our, you know, Bitbanger, our Bitbanger, anything that we have going on. Uh, to actually live demonstrations over the air working uh, to present it at DEF CON. All right, thank you everybody. This is great. Uh, looking looking forward to the next week uh, and uh, just being able to, to to help everybody is a, is a huge thrill. So definitely appreciated. All right, see you all on Slack. Thank you, see ya.